this is done great so basically what i felt ken was before we start i just felt that we could keep one minute silence because lisa lost her mother on saturday uh, and then one and a half days later she lost her mother's sister uh, I mean, and the mother was 99 so i just felt that maybe we can just keep a bit of a silence and there are other people who are part of the media trust collective who also lost like rosalia in canada she lost her father some time back indrani had lost her father so i think i thought maybe if we could just keep that one minute of silence are you okay with that totally perfect thanks I think we'll, I think we'll go. Thank you, Ken. So, Thank you. And before you start again, let me tell you that Isaac from Ghana has sent me this. Today is Ghana Day on the show, so he sent his national dress. This is the way it's going to be. I ask people, let me see if someone sends it. It's a let's see, but I've put that message out. Why not promote that also? Promoting BDSM and culture and everything. This is an integral part of it. I feel very nice. and like always i will take that 2 minutes to tell people what all is coming up this is look i use you this is i'm using you <laughs> because that's what i'm for <laughs> no 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 that's not what you're for but i just take this opportunity because of the fact that i put out so many posts that people definitely don't end up looking at them so give me just do that 2 minutes and I have to start with this always because it's very nice. You you've been to Woodstock. You went to Woodstock. Yes. So you must be privileged. You've been to Woodstock of mediation also. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. So basically, we started October with Meghle. She's from Lithuania, and in conversation, then of course your series because of the fact what you mentioned. I really thought this really resonated with me that there's something that can fundamentally change someone's life. Let's put it out. Let's give them that. So your lecture came in, Mr. Panchu's lecture came in. He's a legend in India. Then Will Work for Food came in. They came, very nice team. Then Jonathan Lux could not come in because he was not. He'd taken his second shot of COVID, the vaccine. Rafael yeah. Lobo, Mexico, very <laughs> nice conversation that was. The things that he's doing in Mexico. Then of course this lecture of yours. then we have your book which is going to be interesting like i said not read person with a well read person let's see how it goes <laughs> okay then we have michael lang's book and if people get purchase their book and i have sent the code out also if you want then we have that limited to a nice very nice person in singapore then katerina in poland she comes in 30th october then this is what i am doing every last day of every month can celebrating the birthdays of people in mediators in that month so i did put it out there was a very good response but i did not get too many people whose birthdays were there to come in so i'm just sending a message out that if it's your birthday please tell me please come i'll send the zoom link let's just celebrate your birthday and anyone who wants to attend the party please send me a message this is 31st october last day of the month 7:30 pm india time every month then we have michael lang's lecture for on the november this is now november november starts his lecture on 3rd november then we have liliana she's here also she's from argentina very nice person her in conversation with a beautiful mind then we have mr akisanya from nigeria his lecture then we have bernie myers he's coming in the evolution of a mediator you would know him obviously you would know him so yes yeah. so that then we have gunavati malaysia she is her lecture then kathy potter i don't know whether you have you met kathy potter very interesting work she is doing i mean the way she is getting art and mediation together her session in the symposium was very interesting if you, if you i mean if you find time sometime maybe 
we'll watch that. Then we have Raphael coming as a lecture. And then we have Andrea. Andrea was here last time you were here. She's part of the Michael Lang's group also, that reflective practice group. So then she comes. So Ken, thank you very much. You've given me the opportunity. I have used you as much as I could. <laughs> now, please. And okay, Liliana is here. Liliana, you want to say hi to Ken? Yes. Hola. Hola, Ken. Hola. Hola. Okay, now she's, nice now to she's... meet you and uh, nice to have the opportunity to learn from you. Thank you. But Ken, tell me, I'll tell you, I'll tell you people like Lenyana is our target. She's, she's actually looking at mediation as her profession totally. And that is what people are not being able to do around the world. So we have to be able to create opportunities for them. However, that has to happen. So that is one important part. If we can do that, I think a lot of good people can come into the fold. So that's how I look at it. Okay, Lenyana, you're going mute now. Thank you very much for... <laughs> Yes, Ken, please. It's all yours. I won't, I'm obviously not going to come in. Please. Thank you, Vikram. Uh, thank you, Liliana, for coming and being with us today. And all of those who will be listening in or watching at a later point. Um, what I would like to do is to explore um, the place where a deep understanding of conflict comes together with technique. Because a part of uh, the object of understanding conflict uh, is to lead us in the direction of technique. So if we understand, for example, just at a very simple level, that people in conflict don't feel listened to, then it's obvious that listening is going to be a useful mechanism. Um, but what I would like to do is something that really uh, is not a part of ordinary conflict resolution training. And that is to look more carefully at what exactly it is that we are listening to and for. So uh, in the beginning, conflict is an experience. Um, it is an experience that takes place inside our bodies that respond uh, radically to uh, the perception of a threat uh, or disrespect um, uh, or uh, any form of hostility. Um, but we also um, know that conflict happens mentally. Um, that is, it takes the form of thoughts, um, of judgments, of ideas about people, about circumstances, about what's important, about what's not important. And the next step in that process is for those thoughts to take, to come out into the world. Uh, and they come out into the world in the form of language. But what we have not really looked very carefully at is the language of conflict how it is that we talk to one another about our conflicts and what we might be able to do to shift those conversations in a transformative direction. So we have conflicts taking place in our bodies, in our minds. We also, of course, in every conflict, experience emotions. Um, and it's important to acknowledge that every conflict without exception has an emotional component. That emotional component can be very small and subtle, or it can be very grand uh, and compelling. But the important part is to recognize that there is an emotional component there. And that requires us then to ask, how well trained are we in responding to intense negative emotion? How are we doing? And the answer, I would say, is not nearly well enough. Um, there are some other locations of conflict. So we have conflict. Hello, Isaac. Thank you for joining us. Um, we have conflict that takes place inside our physical bodies, uh, inside our minds, uh, within the emotional processing centers of our brains. Um, and we also have. Uh, a couple of deeper still arenas in which conflict is experienced. And these now begin to be quite subtle. The next one 
um, is uh, simply apparent if we ask the question, uh, in addition to physical, mental, and emotional, what else is there? And I think for most people, the answer will be spiritual. The problem with the word spiritual is that it implies religion, even a specific religion. But I'd like to redefine that term in ways that are more useful to us. And that is um, what spirituality, in my view, consists of is the quality of life. Uh, of uh, energy that is flowing inside of each of us and around us and between us. And it is the ability to perceive that energy, the quality of that life energy that opens up for us um, avenues and approaches to conflict resolution that we might not otherwise consider. So if we're now thinking about people talking to one another, um, what is the most uh, important element in any communication? And I can tell you the answer because it's been studied. And a research project at um, UC Berkeley, my alma mater, uh, found that um, the, um, about approximately 70% of the meaning of any communication is given by tone of voice. And another 20% is given, 23, 24%, something like that, is given by body language. And only about seven or 8% boils down to the dictionary definition of the words that we are using to talk to one another. Nowhere is this more true than when there are deep, emotionally significant communications that are trying to take place, positive and negative. In positive, we think about love. So here is a model of communication. This is kind of the standard model, and it consists of these elements. One, there is a speaker, and the speaker is supposed to be articulate. Two, the speaker uh, delivers a message, and the message is supposed to be clear. And the speaker does this using a medium, and the medium is supposed to be appropriate so that it will be received by a listener on the other side, and the listener is supposed to be paying attention um, and actually listening. And the theory then is um, the communication gets through. The reality is different. So uh, every one of us has had the experience of being in a relationship that was breaking up and having been articulate, um, having been clear in our message, uh, having used a medium that's appropriate and the listener is listening and the message does not get through. And we've all been in a position where we have fallen in love. And now um, the speaker is half drunk the message is in a foreign language, the medium is totally inappropriate, uh, and the listener is half asleep, but the message gets through. Why? And the answer is because we've left out something significant. And the significant thing we have left out is the context of the communication. In conflict, the context of every communication is hostile, adversarial, disrespectful, uh, demeaning, um, contradictory, uh, etc. And so the difficulty is that when we begin to look at language and the translation of physical, mental, emotional, even energetic experience into words, what we discover is that those words uh, are capable of grossly distorting the meaning of whatever communication we want to deliver. So how do we understand this? Uh, what exactly is it that takes place? Um, and here I think there's a simple introduction to this. And the simple introduction is a question. And the question is to each of you. When you are about to engage in a conflict with someone and you're right there and they're there and you're about to speak to them and you're upset and you're angry, 
what is likely to be the very first word out of your mouth. Any ideas? Uh, you're muted, Vikram. I was thinking that maybe Liliana wanted to say something. Ah. Um, so the first word that comes into my mind at the beginning yeah. of the discussion, um, probably for me, it will be like a negative, like a no or yeah. something like that. It makes sense? Yeah. Uh, I can tell you generally what that negative feeling attaches to, the word that it connects to, and that usually is the word you, yeah. said in a negative way, okay, you, Yes. right, um, and now we're off and running, so the very first word is already um, the invitation into uh, an adversarial conversation. Uh, into hostility, um, into the tango. And now, what do we do with that word? Well, the first thing that we do is we see that it's a pronoun. And then we ask the question, what is the form of that pronoun? And what is the likely outcome of using it in this context? Well, the form is, it's an accusation. You don't have to say anything, but the word you spoken in that way is an accusation. What are you going to get automatically, predictably, inevitably, right away? Answer, denial and counter accusation. Is that a conversation that's going to work? Answer, no, unless you want it to work in a negative way. So are there other pronouns? Well, first let's look at some of the other pronouns that can also have a negative effect they. So if we say, for example, you are lazy, that's an accusation. If we say they are lazy, the form of that is a stereotype. We've taken a group of people, lumped them together, and characterized everyone in the group according to that one characteristic. Um, and what we will get as an outcome is prejudgment, prejudice. So Every time we use the word they in a negative way about a group of people who have done something we don't like, we have created a stereotype and a prejudgment. And if they really are the problem, we have also created invisibly uh, a justification for genocide. Because the only thing to do is to take them out and get rid of them. Uh, he and she is demonization and victimization of the self. Uh, and once again, we're in a negative arena. But now uh, there are other pronouns. Here's one of them, it. If we can describe the problem as an it, then what will happen is it's no longer necessary to deny it or to counterattack. What's the form of that? Um, you are lazy and it is there's a lot of work to be done. How should it be divided? Um, notice the difference in the outcome. Subtle shift in the form of the communication of the very first word out of our mouths. And um, we end up in a completely different place. It's also possible to use the word I, as in, for example, you are lazy. I wish I could take time off but I don't have the opportunity to do that. And I feel disrespected when you don't come and help me when I'm working hard. Um, that's a confession. And there's another I form, which is a request. And we'll come back to this in a moment. Here's the request. Um, I need some help. Can you give me a hand? Uh, and now, what is underneath you are lazy, they are lazy, he, she, uh, it are lazy. Um, and the answer is, can you give me a hand? That's the deeper um, uh, expression, uh, the more significant expression, the more emotionally um, uh, revealing expression, because we are now becoming open and vulnerable in the presence of someone we do not trust. 
So uh, what allows us to do that? And one of the things that allows us to do that is skill in reframing the pronouns. And we can go to we, as in we have a lot of work to do. Um, how should we divide it? Right, very different outcomes for each one. Now, that's just the first word. And if this was all there was to it, we could stop here. What's the second word? The second word is verb. And the second word is you are, right? Not you did, or I wish you would do differently, uh, but you are. Um, and that takes the form of a judgment. As soon as we hear the words, you are, the immediate response is, no, I'm not. You don't know me well enough to know what I am. Um, and um, you are something else, uh, just in order to create a kind of rough um, accusational equity by accusing someone else of something when they've accused you. That's the very first response. Why do we do that? Because subconsciously, what we are actually trying to do is to say, um, you know, that hurt what you just said to me. And I would like to be able to communicate to you how much that hurt my feelings. But if um, right now I don't really trust you well enough to open up and be that vulnerable in the presence of someone who doesn't really like me. Um, and so um, instead, uh, I'm going to um, give you, because I'd like to communicate to you about how bad this feels, but because I can't really do that directly, I'm going to do it indirectly by insulting you so that you will then understand what it feels like to be insulted and you will decide not to insult me um, because you know how it feels. Good luck, right? It doesn't, it's not going to work because everybody feels hurt by the insult. So these are the first two words, and we can shift from you are to you did, or I wish you would, uh, or would you please, uh, or any number of different words that are about the future rather than about the past. Um, but the third word is the one that actually is, gives us the most leverage. And the third word is the insult, the accusation. You are a whatever. If we, if we go back to you are lazy, what is the word lazy? What does it actually represent? What's beneath it? And here I want to give you several layers of what's beneath it. Layer one, every accusation is a negative, indirect statement of interests. You're really saying to someone, I, I really would like some help here, but you framed it negatively and indirectly instead of telling them directly how you feel. Um, number two, every accusation is a negative, indirect statement of emotion. You are experiencing intense emotion around this, and you are trying to communicate what that emotion is, but you're not doing it very skillfully so the other person doesn't really get it. Um, but if we can take that statement of emotion and turn it into one that is direct and one that is positive, then we're going to get a fundamentally different response. So those are the two operations to start with. Take the uh, indirect and make it direct, take the negative and turn it into a positive. What is the positive of lazy? Um, maybe the answer is relaxed, um, able to enjoy life, um, not feeling compelled to work all the time, um, whatever it may happen to be. But for every accusation, it is possible to find some underlying positive way of saying it. But the truth is really underneath it is a request for collaboration, a request for partnership for us together to do the work that belongs to both of us. That's what's going on under the surface. Now, what else is happening? What caused you to jump 
to that accusation rather than going in that positive and direct um, uh, uh, sort of uh, along that path. Um, and I think that there are two things that are underneath it. One, uh, beneath uh, every accusation in close and intimate relationships, not necessarily ones uh, that are more distant, but certainly between couples and families, um, people in the workplace, there is something hidden. And the thing that is hidden is this. Beneath the idea that says you are lazy is a deep-seated relational doubt. Meaning, do you care about me enough to want to help me? Um, and the difficulty is uh, that our assumption is sometimes no, that we do not, uh, we, we don't believe the other person cares enough about us. How does that deep-seated relational doubt show up? Um, if, the, if the doubt is you don't love me, you don't care about me, then what I want to do is I want to actually uh, behave in a way that gives you uh, some justification for withdrawing your emotion from me in order to test and see whether you really don't love me. But underneath it is, you don't love me enough to help me. And what's beneath that? Sometimes, not always, there is a still deeper, very, very subtle level. And this is uh, a deep-seated self-doubt. And the form of the self-doubt is, I am unlovable. Now, let's go back to you are lazy. By just focusing on that phrase, we missed all of that other stuff happening below the surface. And every one of those things that I've just mentioned is an opening in the direction of transformation. It is a way of fundamentally shifting the form of the conflict away from one that is adversarial and hostile uh, into one uh, in which dialogue becomes possible. So uh, we can see that, and I think that this is just touching the surface of it. There's a lot more to be said, and I've written an, um, a chapter in a book called The Dance of Opposites, uh, and the chapter is called The Language of Conflict. And there are metaphors, there are um, all kinds of little things that we can take a look at. Um, and one of the things that mediators are generally not taught uh, is how to think about the metaphors that people use to describe themselves and each other and the issues. But those metaphors uh, have a tremendous impact on what happens in the conflict. They carry with them a set of assumptions that are difficult um, and uh, uh, can get us into deep trouble. So what we want then to do, for example, is to flip the metaphor. So uh, for example, if someone says, uh, I feel trapped in this relationship, what we can say is, uh, well, let's uh, open up a conversation that gives you some freedom to think about what you would like uh, and what kind of relationship you most want to have, right? But it's, it's not the content. What we have done is we flipped the metaphor from trapped to free. And that has an impact on how people think. Here's another piece drawn from neurophysiology. Um, here are the experiments. Uh, if you ask a group of people to you put people into different rooms and you ask them to negotiate a, a, uh, the best price they can get for a used car, you will have one outcome. But in another room, if you tell people to negotiate the best fair price for a used car, you will get a very different outcome. Why? Because that word fair that you have planted, that you have communicated to them, percolates through the subconscious in a way that 
reorients people's attitudes in a more collaborative direction. Not always, not everywhere, but often enough to know that this is uh, often the case. Um, here's another one. Um, the, uh, you ask people to come and be interviewed. Uh, this is all these research projects are done on college campuses with undergraduates. Uh, and they have to walk down this hallway and unbeknownst to the person who's coming for the interview, uh, the researchers have put a wallet on the floor that has some money in it. And in the wallet are one of two photographs. One is a nature scene and the other is a photograph of a baby. Guess which wallets get returned most often? And it's the one with a baby. Why? Because seeing the photograph of a baby triggers the parts of your brain that release oxytocin, um, that build trust in relationships. Um, and um, those have an impact on our behavior. Again, not always, not everywhere, but over a period of time, you can see the pattern quite clearly. Here's another one. Uh, in Europe, in many places around the world, there are uh, bathrooms and bathroom attendants and you can leave a tip for the bathroom attendant. And the question is, how much is that tip? And what they do is they put on the wall a word, just a little piece of paper with a word on it. And the word can either be something neutral or it can be a word like respect, dignity, caring. And those tips go way up as a result of having that word on the wall. So what is this about? This is called priming. In other words, what we are doing is we are in a way kind of being suggestive to people about how they might approach their conflict by giving them a set of words that will allow them to recognize that what they have been doing up until now um, is not very effective. Um, and again, this isn't always and everywhere, but it's enough. So now we have, we're going to move from um, the experience of conflict to the language of conflict, to stories, conflict stories. So the next iteration of the conflict is the story, the story that you tell about what happened. And here we can see that there are three levels of stories. Level one, the story you tell other people. Level two, the story you tell yourself. Level three, what I call the core story, which is the reasons why you made up those other two stories. And now we're starting to talk about where the story comes from. And here, um, it's important for us to recognize um, that uh, conflict resolution is largely a storytelling process. Uh, there's a wonderful writer in the United States whose name is Rebecca Solnit, uh, and she's a feminist writer. She writes a lot of very interesting uh, articles. Uh, she wrote one book with a terrific title, uh, which is, uh, the title is in quotes, men explain things to me. Isn't that wonderful? Um, and here's what she writes. I'm going to read you a quote from her. Stories save your life. And stories are your life. We are our stories. Stories that can be both prison and the crowbar to break open the door to that prison. We make stories to save ourselves or to trap ourselves or others. Stories that lift us up or smash us against the stone wall of our own limits and fears. Liberation is always in part a storytelling process, breaking stories, breaking silences, making new stories. Is that nice? So here is uh, the difficulty. Um, the, um, the very first form that any communication about a conflict 
takes uh, is the form of a story. And we tell that story again to others, to ourselves, and we need to look at uh, why we made up those stories. And stories uh, have been studied um, uh, at the University of Vermont in Burlington. They looked at 1700 stories and identified the emotional arcs in the conflict stories. So what are the emotional arcs? Well, there can be a very steady rise uh, in uh, what they call emotional valence, uh, like a, a rags to riches story or um, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland that they cite. Uh, there can be a steady ongoing fall in the emotional valence as in Romeo and Juliet. Uh, there can be a fall and then a rise. There can be a rise and then a fall. Uh, there can be rise, fall, rise, fall, rise, fall. Um, and if you map various uh, conflict stories in literature, you can see that they have this kind of emotional valence. So what is the emotional valence of the conflict stories that we tell um, to others and to ourselves? Uh, what is it that happens in the story? And um, I think that the answer is this, and I'm going to tell a story now uh, about Vikram. Uh, is that okay, Vikram? Absolutely, okay. absolutely. It has to be okay. <laughs> do I have okay. a choice? <laughs> yes, you do. You can always say no, and I'll pick Liliana or someone. Uh, okay, so here's the story about Vikram. Story number one, three stories. One. Uh, I was walking down the street, minding my own business, and I bumped into Vikram, and I insulted him for no reason. What's your response to that story? Well, probably it's, wait a minute, why did you do that? That wasn't very nice. We are not going to sympathize with you. We are withholding our sympathy from you. We're going to sympathize with Vikram. Well, that's the last time I'll tell that story. So here's story number two. I was walking down the street, minding my own business, and I ran into Vikram, uh, and um, he insulted me for no reason, and I could have stopped him, but I didn't. Well, okay, that doesn't sound very nice. I've just kind of left out the part that I insulted Vikram first. And now, um, uh, if you could have stopped this, why didn't you do that? In other words, you had the power to do something about your conflict. And as a result, we are going to withhold empathy and sympathy from you. Now, uh, story number three. I was walking down the street, minding my own business, and I ran into Vikram and he insulted me for no reason. And now you're going to probably say, oh, that awful Vikram, why did he do that? And you poor thing, you were insulted for no reason and um, I've left out the part that I could do something about it because obviously that didn't work. And now I've finally got the story that's gonna work for me. So what is the action of the conflict story? And I think it is this, it is trading power for sympathy. So if I tell a story in which I have a lot of power, I don't get sympathy. I have to tell the story in a way that takes the power away from me, that leaves me powerless in the face of some evil. Um, and that's the form of the fairy tale. It's um, uh, the beautiful princess, the wicked witch, and the knight in shining armor. In other words, it's the victim, the perpetrator, and the rescuer in a very nice triangle. And it works. Um, because it's set up to work. And that is essentially the emotional arc of conflict stories. So all here we have to start with uh, a different idea. Here's what many beginning mediators do. They think that they're supposed to figure out whether the story people told is true or not. But the problem is, uh, what kind of truth are we talking about? And if we are looking for factual truth, then 
that's not going to help us um, reach the person at an emotional level when what they are actually trying to communicate is an emotional truth. And here is the basic idea. Uh, I'll put it in the form of a question. If you are telling a story about a conflict that has happened to you, and you have a choice between factual accuracy and emotional accuracy, which one will you choose? Uh, I can tell you based on experience, it's emotional every time. Why? What is the point of the story? The point of the story is I want you to understand what it felt like, not to understand the facts. I want some sympathy here. I want a little stroking because I feel bad about what happened. And if we're just stuck with the facts, that's frankly not going to do it for me. So I need instead to strengthen the emotional elements in the story so that they produce the kind of response that I'm looking for. And how exactly do I do that? Uh, and the answer is by a very subtle job of editing in which we take out the stuff that just essentially doesn't work. Um, and now let's look at this in a little bit uh, more a, a deeper way. The first thing we have to say is that all stories are at least partially true. All conflict stories are true on some level. Um, because if they weren't, we would uh, not be able to use them successfully and get the sympathy that we want. So, uh, but at the same time, we can also say that all conflict stories are false because they leave out the other person's story. They leave out all the stuff that would cost us sympathy. So in other words, there are degrees and varieties of truth. And what we are really looking for in mediation is the metaphoric truth, the deeper emotional truth of the story. If we are operating in a legal environment where we are mediating, for example, litigated cases, then we have a separate obligation oftentimes to the court um, to, and I speak now as someone who's been a judge, uh, so I know how this process works. Um, the judge wants to know, how do I decide between these two people who's right and who's wrong? Who, who wins and who loses? Well, that's not the problem in mediation. The problem in mediation is how do we help everybody win in a way that doesn't require anyone to lose? And how do we do that? The answer is, instead of disproving the facts in a story, we have to discover what that deeper truth of the story actually is. Um, I'll give a small example. Um, uh, this is a divorce. Uh, the wife says uh, to me in front of the husband, uh, he doesn't think I'm a very good mother. Okay, now what is that? Well, the first thing that we can say is uh, that this is a place where she is not asserting the fact of whether he thinks that or doesn't think that, because what's going to happen if I ask him is going to, he's going to say, no, I don't think that at all. But that doesn't answer her deeper question. Her deeper question is, um, uh, the way you talk to me in this conflict is so negative and hostile that I believe, I feel that you don't think that I'm a very good mother. And I don't like that feeling, and I'd like to have that shift in a different direction. Now, what do you do as the mediator? Well, here's one approach. Turn to the guy and say, is that true? Do you think that she's not a very good mother? He'll say no. And then you say, can you tell a story about something that she did that you believe shows that she's a good mother? And she isn't expecting that. And now he tells a story. Can you tell another? He tells another. Can you tell a third? He tells a third. And now I turn to her and I say, how does it feel to you to hear him tell those stories? 
And she says, it feels great. I wish you to do that more often. Um, and then I turn to him. Are there things like that that you would like to hear her say to you? Acknowledgements of what you have done? Oh, yeah. Right? So now what we have is a competition for acknowledgement. And as long as it's a competition, only one person can win. And if the other person gets acknowledged, it means you won't. But that's not a non-zero sum game. It's not an interest-based approach. The interest-based approach is to say, you know what? There doesn't have to be a single good parent. What we want is we want to identify the things that both of you are doing that are really good, that you acknowledge and support in one another. Um, and also create a conversation where you're able to raise issues that you have that need resolution, but to do it in a way that doesn't make the other person feel like you think that they're a bad parent, right? So that's an example, a very small example, but it's, uh, I can tell you it happens thousands of times. Um, what makes a story true? And the, the, I think the answer is the fact that it's believed. And here's the problem. In the law, um, there is a digital approach to fact-finding. Something is true or it's false. This goes back to Aristotle and his three kind of basic principles of rhetoric. Um, but we're not going to, we won't go into that today. But to say simply that um, uh, it is possible um, for something to have a meaning to someone that is true, even if the facts aren't. Uh, here's a simple example. You yelled at me. No, I didn't. Well, what is yelling? Well, is yelling raising your voice? Well, if it is, then maybe uh, he didn't yell at her. But if yelling is a negative statement that can even be whispered, then maybe he did. And what she's picking up on is the underlying attitude. So here is a kind of basic way of thinking of conflict stories. I'm going back now to the language and the pronouns I used before. Every conflict story takes the form of an accusation. Beneath every accusation is a confession and beneath every confession is a request. What do we do as mediators? We try to identify the confession and the request. What are you asking her to do differently than what she has done before, right? Those kinds of issues. Um, and um, uh, there's another level of meaning, which is the one that happens inside of us when we tell the story. Uh, and we can ask the question, what are we trying to convince ourselves of by telling this story? Because one of the people, well, this is the, the, the story that we make up that we tell ourselves. And the, there can be multiple answers to this. I'll just give an example. I have mediated hundreds of sexual harassment disputes, hundreds of them. And not one of them uh, did the person who was accused of sexual harassment admit that they had harassed someone. Why? Because someone who is a sexual harasser is bad. I am not bad. Therefore, I'm not a harasser. It's just really kind of that simple. Uh, and emotional logic works in that way. Um, but now we can see that even on the part of the person who is accusing the other person of sexual harassment, sometimes there is a deeper, subtle um, message that is contained in the accusation. And the difficulty with it is that it is an accusation that needs to be surfaced in order to be able to be dismantled in a way to be completed. Uh, yes. Vikram. Hi, Lisa. Thank you for joining us. And I get to unmute for a second. I'm Hi again. Really, really sorry, uh, Lisa. I mean, I'm seeing Lisa now. I've only spoken to her on the phone. And sorry about your mother. 
and your aunt yes thank you thank yeah. you um here is one of the um real uh difficulties in this work and it does have to do with loss um and with people who have left before they've been able to complete the conflict story um and a part of what happens then is that the children carry that story forward invisibly um and what we want to do is to get to a place of completion in which we capture what is positive and beautiful uh, and enduring that we, want, that we respect and admire about the person um, and um, live those values every day. Um, one of the things that sometimes happens in connection with the sexual harassment cases, for example, um, as I was starting to say, is particularly for uh, women who have undergone this experience, there is sometimes a little voice that says, you should have, you didn't, you could have, you ought to have, uh, why didn't you? Uh, in other words, a kind of self-blaming piece of this. And the difficulty with self-blame is that it can come out in the form of a heightened degree of blame directed against others. And so part of what we want to do in that environment, and I've done this many times, is to say, usually that's a woman, um, is there anything that you wish that you had said to him when this happened? And the answer is nearly always yes. And then I say, why don't you say it to him right now? And this is really tough because she's about to let him have it. And that moment when she finally says this frees her and frees him from processing their conflict at a level that is too superficial, um, that doesn't dig deep enough, um, that doesn't allow us um, to alter uh, or transform the way that um, this conflict happens. So now, what are the, the, the resolutions of conflict stories? And here we can say that there are two fundamental, or what I think of as meta resolutions of conflict stories. Here's the first one. Victory over our external enemies, vanquishing our foes, triumphing over evil, and a retributive form of justice that punishes people who've done wrong. Second, victory over ourselves, vanquishing one's own weaknesses and temptations, triumphing over our selfishness, anger, and willingness to be taken advantage of, plus a restorative form of justice that returns people to relationship, a relationship that is more equal, fair, non-adversarial. And this is essentially what we are attempting to do uh, as we are listening to conflict stories. A last piece, a story is not a narrative. And there's a lot more that can be said here. And again, in the book, um, uh, The Dance of Opposites, uh, there's a chapter called The Narrative Structure of Conflict Stories. Now, a story is about something that happened. A narrative is about the person who did it. And in every workplace, people have narratives about the people who are in the other department, the people who are higher up, lower down, in some different silo than the one that they're working in. And what we want to then figure out how to do is how do we transform the stories and how do we transform the narratives? And I think what we do with the stories, there's again in the book, I've mentioned about 30 things that you can do to transform conflict stories. But what we really want to do is we want to find the third story. That is the story that summarizes whatever is useful and true in each person's story and leave out the parts that demonize or victimize the other person. And we can do this through a very simple exercise. And you can use this in your mediation practice. Assign homework assignment. 
go home tonight and write the story of what happened. Um, next, um, try as best you can to write the story of what must have happened to the other person as best you can and see how that feels. Can you do it? And three, combine those stories together and write a third story that brings those truths into some higher relationship. So that's one approach. There are at least 30 others that I've identified and I stopped after 30. Uh, in conflict narratives, what I try to do is to, um, when I'm working with groups, I will ask each group that I'm working with that's in conflict, what do you think about the other people, the people in the other group? And what do you think they think about you? And I'll ask those of both groups and then I'll collect all their answers, bring them together and I will read them out loud to them. And then I will give them an assignment. Meet in your own group and try to identify what are the interests that are underneath these narratives? What are people asking for? What's the request? Uh, number two, what could you do to make sure that nobody ever told that narrative again? And are you willing to present that to the other side and get some feedback about how accurate you were? So uh, this is a kind of very brief description of one of the initial pieces of conflict resolution. It's just the very first words out of our mouths. And now what we have to do is to see that every part of mediation, every part of conflict resolution has a similar richness to it. Um, there is technique everywhere. And in order to get to the technique, what we have to do is we have to dig beneath the surface. But the problem with this is digging beneath the surface requires a higher order of conflict resolution skills. That is, skills in being able to listen to the other person and empathize with them. But those are not skills that we have when we are in the middle of conflict. We have to be cultivated and developed. And there are others as well. So um, I've taken pretty much the whole hour. I was thinking that I would have time at the end, but maybe there's time if there's someone has a question uh, that they want to ask. Um, otherwise, we can uh, come back and do more later. But if anyone has a question or comment or disagreement, you're welcome to mention that. Thing is, Glenn, right now my focus is actually on Lisa because of the fact I'm just thinking the special bond that her mother and her sister had that one and a half days later she passes away. I found that to be, I mean, I mean of course, you lived almost what 90 plus years together, but I'm just thinking that's really a bond that you can't understand. I mean, it's a... yeah. well, you may be able to understand it best, Lisa, because uh, you, you know, know um. I think that they they had a very strong bond. That's very true. And in many ways, I mean, they were always in contact with each other. I think as children, we miss sometimes the bonds that our parents have with one another. And we also fail to appreciate a lot of the strengths that's, that our parents have. You know, I think after they pass away, I'm, I'm seeing a lot more strengths than I knew my mother had. Um, even though I may have recognized them before, they have a new context. That relationship with one another is one of those, I think, that I'm still I'm discovering how strong that was. Um, other than that, I know that we loved my aunt and, and they were always in contact and we enjoyed their company. So... It's, it's interesting. It's interesting how we miss a lot of the quality of interactions in the people around us. We yes. become so insular and, uh, and failing to see, you know, beyond ourselves many times. Absolutely. Very beautifully said, Lisa. Uh, and part of what we want to take from conflict resolution is the need for us to appreciate those in each other and not wait until it's too late. Um, uh, but to uh, use that to develop those 
um, qualities inside ourselves as well and carry that with us. That's what I've done with my parents who died to try to identify what I really admired about them and then try to live up to that in my own life. Let me also again thank Isaac. Isaac, thank you very much. I am promoting Ghana today. Okay, Isaac. I hope you <laughs> like that. <laughs> but the, Lisa, he sent it. Isaac sent this. Imagine someone actually sent me a gift. <laughs> you can see yes, that. Yes, wow. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what, is, what is it called, Isaac? What is this called? What is it called? It is called smoke. 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 Okay, just a smoke. Okay. Great. Smoke, yes. That looks nice uh, on My condolences to Madam Lisa. Lisa, uh, all of them will look nice on me. Let's just send it. All of them will look nice on me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Ken. Thanks a lot. And uh, to seeing you tomorrow. Bye. Seeing you tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that'd be interesting. Bye. Bye, Ken. See you. So, Lisa, I'm so sure. Obviously, you're in shock right now, but I'm just thinking it must be so tough. Yeah, it's been very hard, um, but I think, um, I don't know, I'm having a good day. The waves will come when they come. But maybe I should, I should put it off YouTube right now. Yeah. <laughs>